the Lancaster Street Mummers in Tom Payne and the case of the excise man. In come I, King George III of this land, with my foul budget in my hand. When I was crowned, the civil list was a small detail that I missed. Parliament paid me the same as my dad, but I met him the special deals that he's had. And now I'm the same as an ordinary bloke <laughs> on my uppers, skin, dead broke. <laughs> in come I, George Lewis Scott. Head of the excise is the job I've got. For my excise men, things are tough. The king can't afford to pay them enough. They are on the verge of collapse, but I have a solution that'll help, perhaps. If you've a solution, pray tell me, Scott. You seem to be the best chance that I've got. I can't afford to raise your men's pay, so please help make the problem go away. The best answer to avoid disruption is to expose the evil corruption to which underpaid excise men resort. And sooner than take them all to court, Persuade our masters in Parliament in their fiscal judgment to relent by agreeing an increase in the civil list by making the payments they have missed. And then uh, increasing the excise men's pay so all corruption will go away. <laughs> My situation is so close to tragic, your solution to me seems like magic. But how to persuade the Lords and MPs? They're the ones we have to appeal. I have a very cunning plan, my liege. Sooner than putting Parliament to siege, I will send to every Lord and MP the most finely argued case there can be for agreeing an increase in the civil list to raising money. This plea will come from all the excise men, printed in the words of their man's pen. If we can raise their case in Parliament, then on the civil list they must relent. One follows t'other as summer follows spring. Good man, Scott, this seems like just the thing. I'm not a man consumed by greed. A bigger civil list is all I need. Now, pray, tell me, Scott, how you're doing again. I will approach that radical auditor, Thomas Payne. He is on the excise committee of eight. If he can write as well as he can break, he will convince our masters of our case. So our scheme is proceeding at a pace. In come I, young Thomas Payne, back in the excise team again. I tried in Alford under Mr Swallow, a man as corrupt as he was hollow. I wouldn't collude, got the sack, but a begging letter got me back and after a very short wait was appointed to Lewis in 1768, collecting taxes on beer and wine, chasing smugglers and cunning swine. Born a Quaker and a God-fearing man, I go to church whenever I can. But here in Lewis, I have to grapple with the non-conformists at the Westgate Chapel. And leaving the chapel, it was my fate. Shopkeeper Sammy Olive, in I come. Met Tom Payne, made him a chum. He rides for the excise and collects for the king. His radical opinions are to my liking. Tom Payne, it's lodgings. Sorry. You need a place to live. Lodgings at Bull House, I'd like to give. At our shop, stuff and backy we sell. Our back room will suit you well. Ah, I accept your offer. How kind thou art. I've grown tired of the white art. The excise meets there. Nine bold men who are chastened by their masters again and again. Their pay doesn't support body and soul. Don't my colleague's honesty is the toll. Now, if there's room for me horse and me, I'll stay with you as long as you can be. Well, I'm glad to help improve your life. Now, come meet my daughter and my wife. Thomas, this is my only daughter, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, my only daughter. She's still waiting for a man to court her. See? And this is my lovely wife, Esther. No shopkeeper can best her. Oh. Welcome, Tom Payne, to Old Bull House. I am Samuel's loyal spouse. And though his words were kindly meant, Elizabeth is single, but not discontent. She's happy with her spinster life. No, oh. she lacks a man to take her as wife. Welcome to Lewis, young Mr. Payne. I hope in Bull House you will remain. Mother and father's introduction to you might make you think things untrue, but don't let them make you worry. I'm not about to marry in a hurry. Thank you all for being so kind. These are good lodgings to find, and it's good too to have a friend to help me apprehend the way the town proceeds. 
to meet all its subjects' needs. And as a member of the court league, my role in Lewis would be complete. If you prove an helpful dodger and not a simple artful dodger, I will see. Well, you do. I will do whatever I, I, will do whatever I can to make you an important man. The court league does need someone new. So I'll see what I can do for you. Thanks, Mr. Oliver. That's all I need, a chance to speak and take the lead. Within the exercise, I've been held back, which could be the chance I lack. Was it you I've seen bowling on the Castle Green? May I make an humble request accompany you as your guest? Certainly, Tom. You'll enjoy the game and a few rum punches, just the same. And when the game is done, we start our political debates at the White Hart. Right. There we put the world's wrongs to rights and discuss the latest wars and fights. Right, yeah. Fair of wages. God save the country! God save the king and country! God save the king and country! No, God save the king! In come I, Henry Verrill, ex-landlord of the pub and organiser of the Edstrong Club. Welcome, Tom Payne. Let's hear your views on the excise men's pay, the latest news. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, this, this is a big issue about to erupt. Yeah. Excise men are either poor or corrupt. That's true. They cannot exist on their paltry pay, so they have to earn enough money another way. Either by simply turning a blind eye and letting the smugglers pass on by, or by colluding with rogue traders and collecting less from right. known evaders. Right. 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 In the stable yard, there is a stranger, which puts your radical speech in danger. The King's Commissioner of Excise comes in. George Lewis Scott, you may begin. Gentlemen, greetings. May I buy you all a drink? Oh, it will be served in the other bar, I think. It is of good ale to you I'll sing, and to good ale I'll always cling. I like my mug filled to the brim, and I'll drink all you'd like to bring. Oh, good ale, thou art my darling, thou art my joy, both night and morning. Tom, I will make my role a little clearer if you will come a little nearer. Your radical reputation as orator and writer can make the excise men's future brighter. All you have to do is plead your case in a well-argued paper which I will place in the hand of every MP and Lord. The pen is mightier than the sword. But how can I find time to do it justice? And I might not point out that the thrust is poor pay leads to corruption and collusion. Surely they'll be hard to disillusion. And one more thing I must point out, in order to write it, without a doubt, I must have paid leave from my work. The excise collection, I cannot show it. Now, how many copies of this paper do you need? Enough for the great and good to read. I will give you time off to write your plea. As for the cost, you can leave that to me. I have a greater cause than excise men's pay, so do it discreetly and don't delay. As for getting 4,000 printed, that's down to me, as I have hinted. I will pay as much as the excise can afford, but pray, do not spread this news abroad. And if my wife did me despise, how soon I'd give her two black eyes. But if she loved me like I love thee, what a happy couple we should be. Oh, good ale, thou art my darling, thou art my joy, both night and morning. Excuse me, sir, I must speak to Tom Payne. I'm sure you'll see him soon again. Tom. My dear husband Samuel has passed away. In Bull House, you may no longer stay. But with you, as you know, we have no quarrel. But to live with two women is not moral. That's right. So for tonight, you must find another place. But please return tomorrow to bury the dead. Madam, I'm truly sorry to hear your news. But I will seek repose elsewhere as you choose. I would not like you earn a critical frown from the good wives of this Puritan town. But tomorrow I'll come back and bury Sam to show you what an honest man I am. And, and if you want help with the shop, I'll volunteer without stop. And so the townspeople won't us harry. Elizabeth and I will quickly marry. <laughs> then I'll have the key of the door. Without Samuel, you'll be poor. I will see if Elizabeth gives her consent. Of course. You would still have to pay rent. <laughs> uh, work for us like any lackey. 
There's so little profit in our backy. Well, I know a preacher. Please tell her it's not a love match. That's right. Please tell her <laughs> it's not a love match. I know I'm not a prize cat, but it's a matter of common sense to live together and save our pence. Yeah, yeah. And we'll tie the knot as soon as she likes. I'll have a word with the vicar up at St. Mike's. In come I, Henry Verrill, publican and friend, to tell you the beginning of the end. Tom married Esther on his daughter, but he didn't treat her as he ought to. Shame. Some say he had too much to drink, but he had no desire for her, I think. He cut up the tobacco and ground the snuff and thought that hard work was enough to endear him to wife and mother. Of course, his writing was another reason for his absence from the marriage bed. His passion was for truth and justice instead. You're not treating my little chicken. Now, dear, dear wife and little. mother, you should know it's the office in London I must go. I've been chosen to argue the cause of the excise men's pay without pause. So during the winter of 1772, writing a paper is what I must do. George Lewis got a family room to work in. So I can write my plea without shirking. Now, I, I know it's hard, but I do this with good intent, and I will send you money to pay the rent. Oh. Now, I'm not certain that you, you'll miss me, so as I leave, wife, please, kiss me. I'll kiss you goodbye without breaking my heart. I've been waiting in vain for this marriage to start. <laughs> it's true you've been a good and honest man, yeah. and helped run the business true to plan, but it's led me to having a miserable life as a hard-working woman and unfulfilled oh, wife. Dear. Well, I'm sorry you raised this as I leave, but wasn't my intention to deceive. Now, whatever love you may feel, this marriage was a business deal, one in which I played my part. So, my dear wife, I must depart. That was not the end of Tom's marital woes before he to his job in London goes. Elizabeth tries to have the marriage annulled claiming she has been effectively gulled. But Tom had remained a celibate from their very wedding date. Dr Chambers was called to decide if Tom could satisfy his bride. He found no medical cause to explain and advised Elizabeth to try again. I've told the doctor it is too late, my absent husband to accommodate. Whilst these months he's been away, We've seen our business decay. Uh, and now, in 1774, Old Bull House will thrive no more. Shame. No longer will you hear our tinkling bell. Because of his neglect, we must sell. Uh, I can live without an absent mate. The time has come to separate. Uh, well, my, my case for the Office of Excise was well received. Yay! It wasn't mine. Soon I find out I've been deceived. Well, the excise office claimed I neglected my work. I protested I didn't shirk. But when my paper was published and read, George Lewis Scott, he come to me, he said, I'll tell, ben I'll tell Ben Franklin you are the man America needs at this time, in the van, and arrange it in London. I should know all the intellectual cream. And lo, Ben Franklin said, look, in London, you've done your best. Go join the revolution out in the West. So I sailed there at my own expense. Wow. I fought for them and I wrote common sense. Oh. And to this day, history relates, I invented the term United States. Well, yeah. well, damn me. <coughs> Scott sent the case of the officers around. The writing and the logic were sound. Pay's paper persuaded the men in power. It was the right message at the right hour. And though it seems the target was missed, later on, they did improve the civil list and raised some of the excise men's pay. But by then, Tom Paine had been sent away. I heard about his works in America later. I read Common Sense, his famous book. I found it in Windsor. I had to take a look. But by then, he was an anti-royalist orator. And I demanded he be arrested as a traitor. Hang him! Hang him! No, in, no, in Blake's garden, I heard the baying mob. I said, who are they after? Someone to rob? Well, Blake told me it's you they're after, Tom Payne. You leave for France, don't come back again. 
put, I'll put you in jail, leave you to rot. Revolution is the only chance I got. So I joined the Revolutionary Council. Yeah. Was fiercely anti-royalty until they wanted to execute Louis Capet. I said, that's something you'll regret. Robespierre put me, put me in the Bastille. Yeah, it wasn't until I upfield appeal to America's President Monroe that the French finally let me go. Tom spent his last years in the States, where, as history relates, he wrote his book, The Age of Reason, which led them to accuse him of treason. In that land of militant Christianity, <laughs> doubting God was pure insanity. So, Tom died a desperate and a broken man. Pray judge him by his works, if you can. He famously wrote, to give him his due, Together, Together we, we can, can build, build the world anew! Ladies and gents, in this day, on this brightness of summers, well, it says that in my script, please remember the humble work of the mummers. As players, we try to tease and entertain, and next week we're performing again, not here, East Oathley. So, we've done our best, we can't do better. Please, put some money in the bucket for Lewis Theatre. I love thee in the early dawn, I love you in daylight, dark or dawn. But when I'm weary, worn or spent, I turn the tap and ease the vent. Oh, Glendale, thou art my darling, thou art my joy both night and morning. It is you that makes my friends my foes, it is you that makes me wear old clothes. But since you come so near my nose, it's up you come and down you goes. Oh, Grinnell, thou art my darling, thou art my joy both night and morning. It is of good ale to you I'll sing, and to good ale I'll always cling. I like my mug filled to the brim, and I'll drink all you'd like to bring. Oh, good ale, thou art my darling, thou art my joy both night and morning.